Is the intention of the government to introduce five bills? Housing Accords and Special Housing Areas Bill Introduction, Social Housing Reform and Housing Restructuring and Tenancy Matters Amendment Bill Introduction, New Zealand Public Health and Disability Amendment Bill No. 2 Introduction, Crown Minerals Amendment Act 2013 Amendment Bill Introduction, Customs and Excise Budget Measures Motor Spirits Amendment Bill Introduction. The Housing Accords and Special Housing Areas Bill is set down for first reading forthwith. The Social Housing Reform, Housing Restructuring and Tenancy Matters Amendment Bill, New Zealand Public Health and Disability Amendment Bill No. 2, Crown Minerals Amendment Act 2013 Amendment Bill and Customs and Excise Budget Measures Motor Spirits Amendment Bill are set down for first reading presently. Mr Speaker. Honourable Chris Finlayson. Mr Speaker, I hereby present a report on the rights and freedoms contained in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990 in relation to the New Zealand Public Health and Disability Amendment Bill No. 2. That paper is published under the authority of the House. Mr Speaker. Honourable Dr Nick Smith. I move that the Housing Accords and Special Housing Areas Bill be now read a first time. I nominate the Social Services Committee to consider the bill. Mr Speaker, at the appropriate time I intend to move that the Housing Accords and Special Housing Areas Bill be reported to the House by the 26th of July 2013 and that the Committee have the authority to meet at any time while the House is sitting, except during oral questions and during any evening on a day in which there has been a sitting of the House and on a Friday in a week in which there has been a sitting of the House, despite Standing Orders 188 and 191 1B and C. Mr Speaker, this bill is a core part of the Government's work to improve housing affordability. It confronts the reality that home ownership rates have been in decline for a quarter century, that house prices have soared unsustainably over the past decade, and that far too many families housing, whether to buy or whether to rent, is unaffordable. Mr Speaker, there is no silver bullet to this huge issue. It won't be solved with gimmicks or slogans, but with substantive sound policies that address the real issues that are driving up house costs for New Zealanders. We have founded our housing work on the comprehensive report by the Productivity Commission produced last year. We are particularly focused on the issues of land supply being addressed in this bill. We've got work underway on infrastructure costs announced in February in respect of the review on development contributions. We've got work underway on materials costs with the inquiry that we announced at the weekend. We are taking, making changes to get compliance costs down. We are investing heavily in schools in this budget to improve the productivity of the residential construction sector. It also has to be acknowledged, Mr Speaker, that interest rates play a huge role in housing affordability and home ownership trends. Anybody who looks post-World War II, it is very simple. Home ownership goes up when interest rates are low and down when interest rates are high. I am very proud to be part of a government with an exemplary record on interest rates, the lowest since I was in nappies in the mid-60s, and we are determined to keep them as low for as long as possible. And that highlights the broad reason why we need this bill. We all know house prices are going silly, up 12% in Auckland in the last year. When it happened last decade, the government did nothing. The Reserve Bank wound up interest rates, up went the Keeley dollar, and there was permanent damage to the New Zealand economy. This bill is about avoiding a repeat of that negative economic cycle. The message from the Reserve Bank, from the IMF, from the OECD and from the Productivity Commission is that we must confront and address these land and housing supply issues. Some people are refusing to accept the link between rigid land supply policies and high house prices. I challenge them to look at the evidence. We have seen the availability of sections in Auckland plummet over the past 10 years, and the price of a section has increased over the last five years from $100,000 to $325,000.
The study by Motu showed that raw, undeveloped land in Auckland inside the MUL is 10 times the value of land outside the MUL. We are currently building only 4,000 homes per year in Auckland when we need 13,000 per year to keep up with population growth. Mr Speaker, this bill is a circuit breaker to get some pace and some momentum in addressing housing supply. It recognises that councils control a very important lever with their land supply and housing development policies. It makes provision for accords with local authorities where there are affordability issues. It requires government, in good faith, to work with councils to secure such agreements, like what we've achieved with Auckland, but also enable intervention if we are unable to make progress. The essential mechanism in this bill is the creation of special housing areas. These will be both greenfield and brownfield areas that are suitable for residential development, where infrastructure is available or can be built, and where there is demand for new housing. Within these areas, qualifying developments will be able to be approved on a streamlined process. There is a special, limited notification process for only those affected. Council panels will be required to make a decision within six months on greenfields and within three months on Brianfield developments. Mr Speaker, that compares with at the moment where it takes up and sometimes more than three years. In the Auckland context, this bill enables the Council to get some real progress in implementing its unitary plan in areas that are the least contentious. This is a 30-year plan for 400,000 homes. It enables a robust process for hearings on controversial projects like high-rise apartments, but enables us to get on and build the first 10 per cent of houses in that plan. It's a balanced agreement, and I wish to especially acknowledge Mayor Len Brown for his pragmatism and support in coming to this accord. It's an ambitious agreement and sets out a plan to consent 9,000 homes in the first year, 13,000 homes in the second, and 17,000 homes in the third year. That will have us consenting three times as many homes over the next three years as what has been consented over the last three years. I've been encouraged, Mr Speaker, by the response to the accord. Already a developer has come forward and said that it will enable him to bring forward a thousand sections next year that otherwise would not have done so. ANZ economist Cameron Baker said the accord, quote, hit all the right notes. The EMA chief executive has described it as infinite common sense. He says that it will unlock the log jams to getting houses built and that it's so refreshing to see Auckland Council and central government finding common ground on this difficult issue. The accord is good news for households. It's good news for Auckland and it's good news for New Zealand. Yeah, Enabling the development of 39,000 new homes will take the heat out of the Auckland housing market. It's going to give some hope to families looking for a home, whether they want to rent or buy. The $20 billion build is going to create thousands of jobs. And the relief for the rest of New Zealand is that this increased housing supply in Auckland will take pressure off an early rise in interest rates and upward pressure on the Kiwi dollar. I would also note that the Accord specifically makes provision for more affordable housing. We've shown how to do that with the Hobsonville development, where we've required 20 per cent of new homes to be in the affordable range and targeted to first home buyers. I was advised by the Hobsonville Development Company they're not getting 20 per cent, they're getting 27 per cent of houses sold in that range. A similar approach is required here, where consideration must be given to providing lower cost new homes when approving qualifying developments. This legislation gives us the tools to implement that accord. Mr Speaker, this is an interim measure. My colleague Amy Adams is progressing a comprehensive plan of RMA reforms that will be legislated in time and then with plan changes able to assist with the long-term challenge of housing affordability. Mr Speaker, I cannot help but conclude this debate by challenging the opposition on a few points. First, they have had more positions on the Auckland Council than the Kama Sutra. They have rallied against 
They have rallied against the formation of the Auckland Council, and in the next breath they have rallied to the Council support the Government and demand the Government not intervene on housing issues. And now they oppose the accord that we have successfully come to the Council. Secondly, they have consistently opposed any measures through RMA reform or in this bill to free up new land. I have a simple question for them. How can they promise Aucklanders tens of thousands of homes at $300,000 when the average section price in Auckland right now is $325,000? Now, the idea that the only way to build more affordable homes is for the government to build them is an idea they must have got from the same North Korean economics school that they got their electricity policy from. If they truly believe this nonsense, why stop nationalisation at the housing and the power sector? Let's have cheaper food by the government taking over all the supermarkets, or cheaper cars by having the government buy them all for us. My greatest worry for homeowners, Mr Speaker, is what the Labor Greens policies will do for interest rates. Mr Speaker, sound economic management and a comprehensive approach to housing affordability in all those areas is the best way that we can make homes more affordable for New Zealanders. That's what this government is about, and I call on the House Sorry to support to the sensible member. bill. Mr. Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed. Mr. Speaker. To Phil Twyford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.